Welcome to Longevity Industries presentation of the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast. I, of course, am your host, Dean Phillips. I'd like to thank a couple of our sponsors, Local Enterprise. That's Local Enterprise with a Z, enterprise.com, where they handle the Cody Bot, which is a robot for sanitizing plants and also working with measuring people's temperatures and all that stuff that's really important right now with COVID. And like to thank uh, Precision Metal Forming Association for their continued support of my show. I have with me today Mark Machalski. He comes to us from Sizzle and STEM. Now, you might say to yourself, what does food have to do with engineering and technology? And we will find that out in one second when I bring on Mark. Mark, are you there, sir? I am, Dean. Great to be here. It's great to have you. Mark, of course, is the past president from SME in 2019. Is that correct? I think I have, my, correct. I have my math correct there. And it's yeah. great to have you here. So we, we have a, a little background together. We've known each other for quite a few years. And i just like to know right off the bat, what does food have to do with engineering? Well, before we get started on that specific, I need to explain that my career was spent in manufacturing for years and years. I was a manufacturing engineer and then uh, I ran plants. And uh, when I ended my career, I was uh, CIO for uh, the operations side of a semiconductor company. So when I talk about the things we're going to talk about today, it's in that context. So uh, I'm a manufacturing guy through and through. And Sizzle and STEM is a website that I have developed that really started during COVID. Like a lot of things, a lot of people found themselves shut in the house with things to do, with nothing to do, and they needed to keep themselves busy. So, like a lot of people, I was struggling with getting food into the house, especially during the early days. And hopefully, we won't have that problem again. But during the early days, we would buy food in great quantities at the farm stand, so I would have all this produce. And keeping it healthy, making sure that I used it before it went bad became a challenge. Now, I had a culinary background going back years. Um, I actually spent a little time working as a professional chef during in between some companies that I had started and sold. And uh, I went to, I took, I don't have a culinary degree, but I do have all the training that you would have to get a culinary degree. So... I started sharing recipes on Facebook, uh, mostly as a way to have human contact. And I have a lot of friends who are struggling with, I don't know how to cook and all the restaurants are closed. What do I do? And so I was doing everything from teaching people how to, how to blanch broccoli so that they would get extended time on it and, or doing, you know, simple recipes. And then sometimes a little bit more complex recipes because I wanted to show off. So I shared these recipes and people started saying, you should do a website. And I started thinking about it. And my wife and I talked about it a lot. And I said, well, I got nothing else going on right now. We're stuck in the house. Let me try that out. So after a bunch of nights staring at the ceiling, I realized I needed to talk about the things that formed how I think about food. And then I realized that engineering has influenced how I think about food. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were some other obvious influences, Julia and Jock, Anthony and Ruhlman, Altman McGee, and if you have to ask who they are, that's a whole side <laughs> conversation, but there they are people that are big, a big deal in the, in the food world. And, um, you know, having 40 years of building factories sort of got me into a place where I said, well, what if I took my love for food and married it with my love for STEM? science, technology, engineering, and math. And if you know anything about food, you know that in order to be good at it, you need to know a lot about STEM. Mm -hmm. And so that's how the, the website came to be. That's fantastic. Now, when you think about your career, what specifically within STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, what what about that drove you to say, you know what, this is a lot like project management or a lot like planning because overwhelmingly I hear from a lot of people that say, 
I don't know how to cook. And that's almost like saying, I, I don't know how to follow instructions. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I get that so much. And, and one of the things I try to do a lot on my site was tap into my many, many years of doing process sheets. Uh, early on in my career, I worked for a guy who, who, who I was complaining about doing process sheets for a project we were on. And he said, Mark, you're a manufacturing engineer. There's three things that are going to be constant in your life. Death, taxes, and process sheets. So get over it. <laughs> so, um, but really, uh, people have asked me, what, again, you know, like, what's with the cooking and engineering? And what it really is is I love making stuff. You know, I, I was always that guy who, like, at the end of the month, would walk down onto the dock just so I could see the product go onto the trucks. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love being in factories, so I realized that food is just like making a product. People don't realize that, you know, food is made in small scales in restaurants and in huge quantities in uh, factories. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, there's some stuff on my site that shows, like, how... Heinz ketchup is made in great quantities, how bacon's made, uh, and that kind of thing. And it's uh, and there are articles in there about uh, you know being a food engineer. But the food process is really just like the any other product. It's about the design, the material selection, the process development, and execution. Mm -hmm. When I worked in factories, I learned and taught lean <laughs> concepts. And, you know, if you walk into a kitchen and you say lean, you think you're talking about the steak. But it, those of us who work in manufacturing know what lean's all about. You know, we lay out work cells for flow. We set up work stations for efficiency and mistake proofing. We develop and follow a process for repeatability. When I went to culinary school and I learned and I worked in restaurants, I saw the same thing. But factory lean is different in the kitchen. And they don't even know that they're doing it. There's a concept called mise en place, which is French for everything in its place. And oh, by the way, you don't screw around with some of these mise en place in the kitchen unless you want to get hit over the head with a pan. <laughs> but what that's really about is about setting up your workstation in such a way that in the heat of battle, you know, when the pickets are coming off the machine and you're, you're in the weeds, that you can reach blindly into your, your station and be able to get the peppers or the onions or the garlic or whatever. And, you know, also kitchens are, most kitchens are very cramped, right? So they're set up for very efficient movement. You don't want to have to walk to get anything. You want to just be able to turn around between your stove and your, and your station. You want to make sure that um, your knives are always sharp. People think that sharp knives are dangerous. It's actually dull knives are dangerous. Yeah. That's a whole different thing. 5S. Obviously, we talk about 5S in the factory where we talk about making sure we wipe down the oil off the machines and clean up the little bits on the floor. Clearly, in a restaurant, if you don't 5S your restaurant, the health department is going to have something to say about mm -hmm. it. So, you know, those factors go back and forth between manufacturing and, and food. Um, another parallel is how, how recipes are developed and documented. I learned enough. I learned that it's not enough to make it once. You need to repeat the process, get feedback from your customers, who in my case is my wife. She's eaten a lot of experiments. So <laughs> gone awry, but um, she, she's, she's a trooper. And then you have to document that process in a way that others can recreate your work. I know a lot of things inherently in my head about why things work, and that comes from 30, 40 years of cooking. But to translate those things into recipes that I put on my website, I took the tools that I learned as a manufacturing engineer about creating pictures and talking about why things work so it resonates in somebody's head so mm -hmm. that they can use those skills in their recipe. And some of my articles are just about technique. I, I'm Literally this morning before I got on the uh, on the podcast with you, we were working on a, um, an article about roasting tomatoes and, and why that works. Now, why would I do an article on roasting tomatoes? It's because I use roasted tomatoes in a lot of different recipes. So once you learn how to do that one technique, and once you learn that, you know, Roasting a tomato at low temperature creates caramelization, which is a which is a chemical process that brings out the sugars and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You learn a lot more about how to think about your food 
from a STEM perspective than you do just sort of, well, I'd have gotten says I do this, this, and this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that, that's how I think there's a, a, a parallel between uh, STEM and cooking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We have down here in uh, Tennessee, we have actually toured quite a few food uh, plants over the years uh, from our chapter of SME. And one of them was the Bun Company. And mm-hmm. w- one of the great things that I learned from going there was that you can pick up techniques and important things no matter where you go. And right. it's really interesting because you wouldn't think, oh, well, you know, they're making buns, they're making hamburger buns, they're making uh, different uh, flour based products. And what they're doing, a lot of it is scalability. Uh, how did how do you think when you talk about restaurants how does that work when you're deciding hey i'm going to turn a dish that i'm making for two people into a restaurant uh menu item for 200. well before i answer that question i do want to talk about one quick thing that your story told me about which was um I, I, I was I was at an, an SME event once, and I was working for a company at the time that was making fuel cells, and we were trying to extrude these uh, ceramic parts through a dye. And then there was a post process where you added a coating, and we couldn't get the coating to stick because the ceramics were too smooth. And I ended up at the bar talking to this guy, and he said to me, "You work for a pasta company," and he said. Yeah, what we do is we rough up the inside of the dye so that it creates uh, a texture on the pasta Mm -hmm. so that the sauce sticks. I went back that after that weekend, went back to the factory. I said, we're going to have to rough up the insides of the dyes. And everybody looked at me and said, oh, no, that's never going to work. Sure enough, absolutely works. So you can (laughs) learn something from everywhere. But um, so the, the food product concept is actually like um, any other product. It's actually a small fraction of the process. Uh, once you have that concept down, comes the real work. It's like as a manufacturing engineer, I would always say to the design guys, yeah, that's cool that you made one in the lab. Now we have to make them in quantity. And in manufacturing food development, you learn that you, first and foremost, you need to start with great parts. Bad parts make bad products. No matter how good your factory is, no matter how good your assembly process is, you can have a great staff of technicians in your factory or a great staff of cooks in your kitchen. And if your, pro- if your incoming product is bad, you're not going to make good food or good product. Mm-hmm. So we spend a lot of time working on our supply chain. We spend a lot of time making sure that our, our, our product is, our incoming product is repeatable. So I spend a lot of time with farm stands and I go to um, various stores for cooking one recipe. I may have had four or five different suppliers to do that. And over time you learn which ones are repeatable, which one you can, you know, like having, having a great butcher that you can talk to and, and, and say to him specifically what you need is very different than going to a supermarket and buying something that's shrink wrapped in a package. Mm. So that's part of the process, which is, building up that whole supply chain of parts and then making sure that they're prepped correctly before you even put them into the final product. And then things like, does this process require dry heat, wet heat? Should I be doing this on a saute pan? Should I fire up my grill? Those things are actually developed through experimentation. I'm actually working right now. I have a whole list of, of uh, different uh, chicken wing recipes that I'm putting on the website, taco chicken wings and Korean chicken wings. And because it's winter here in New England, I developed them um, in the summer and everybody's going to look at them and go, that's great. You put them on the grill, but what do I do now that it's 30 degrees out? So I'm redeveloping them now to be done in the oven. And that's required actually some, I, I learned from another cook, that requires a little chemistry. You have to actually add some baking soda to the process to get the crispiness. So it's a lot of experimentation. It is like doing a project. I have notebooks and I have pictures and I have, I actually use 
uh, a lot of the tools you would, I, I have spreadsheets and, and, and uh, other things, uh, mind mapping that I've done for recipes. So, um, you know, there is project management in it and, you know, there's the STEM, I keep going back to it, but the STEM is so important. You know, things like why will my food taste better and less salty if I add salt as I'm going along as opposed to the end because it has to do with the chemistry. You know, understanding how a blender works, you know, the physics of it. I actually have a post on my site that talks about how the, the blades actually create um, the movement in the blender uh, is important because it'll help you understand why you can't blender a potato. It has to do with uh, the way the sugars work. You know, you talked about uh, factory stuff. Making one loaf of, of uh Banana bread, which apparently everybody is making these days, is very different than making them in the, in the South. I, I spent uh, an SME event at a pie company, and I learned a lot uh, about how they do it. And then things like things like math come to mind. Um, people, because I cook a lot, uh, I'll be at somebody's house, and somebody will say to me, hey, can you make a banana bread for the salad? And I just grab stuff out of the refrigerator in their cabinets, and they make it. And a lot of times they'll say to me, how did you do that with other recipes? And I tell them, it's just a ratio. I know what the ratio of fat to acid to spice is supposed to be. So whatever you've got, I just put it together in a ratio. It's like how those people on chop deal with the basket. Mm-hmm. It's about learning the science. So, you know, that's, that's a, a long answer to your question. But one last thing I want to say on that subject is my favorite food book is not a cookbook. <laughs> it's actually a book about food science. Uh, by a uh, guy called Harold McGee it's on food and cooking is the title. And it's a food science book. And it talks about a lot of the things that I'm talking about here. It's about things like why do eggs work the way they do? What happens when you physically manipulate them, you know, beating the eggs? And different types of temperature, how the proteins coagulate and break down. And um, if you understand these kind of things, you can look at a recipe and then you can go, yeah, that seems like a good idea, but I'm going to do it like this. And you start to cool off the top of your head. And I think that is what great engineering is, where you have all those, I know how to do finite element analysis, and I know how to lay out a circuit and all of that, and I have this idea, and now I'm going to apply those technologies to the thing I have rattling around in my head. Food is just like that. You take technology and you apply it to a concept and hopefully you get a great product. My favorite program is Microsoft Project for for many Uh reasons. How much, when you think about how Microsoft Project is, it's it's basically a layout, a visual layout of the planning and understanding how one thing impacts the next. How, as as a resource, I had mentioned to you a, a while back of looking for resources for timing. How do you make a dish so that it comes out, everything is ready at the same time or perceived to be ready at the same time? How, obviously, there's a lot of planning that goes into that, but is that more kind of a Microsoft project kind of thing where, hey, I know I've got to have this started before I start these other aspects so that everything gets ready at the same time? I'd be lying to you if I told you that I actually used Microsoft Project to do a dinner party. But what I've learned from using Microsoft Project definitely applies. You essentially, you say, okay, you back plan. Mm -hmm. You say, okay, I need to put the dinner on the table at 7 o'clock. Right? And so you start back planning it from how long will X take, you know, this particular meal, you know, the potatoes, right? Can I do some prep and hold? So in other words, there are, you know, when you're doing, when you're doing project planning for, you know, a factory or something like that, you're trying to figure out which things absolutely have to be cereal and which things can be done in parallel. So for instance, making mashed potatoes, I can boil the potatoes early in the afternoon and stick them in the oven and hold them, right? I can, um, take and mash them and put them on the stove and reheat them at the last minute. I know that that takes, let's say 10 minutes. So I back plan that from the serving. I say 10 minutes before I'm going to plate, 
I've got to take those potatoes out of the oven that I've already prepped earlier in a parallel sense, put them on the stove top, and get them heated up and ready to go. Same thing with like a meat, for instance. You've got to uh, let your meat rest after you cook it. That's a whole different discussion, science and physics and how heat transfer works. But I know that if I want to carve it at 7 o'clock, I need to make sure that it needs to come out of the oven and be on the counter you know, for like a big roast a half an hour behind. So I look at it and I say, okay, it's 6.30. It's got to be on the counter resting. I know that it's going to take three hours to cook. So at 3.30, it goes into the oven. I may have had to have marinated it 24 hours ahead of time. So the day before, I say, okay, by noontime on the day before, I've got to make sure that I create my marinade. I get the meat into the marinade. It goes into the refrigerator. So 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, I can pull it out and put it into the oven. You see the concept of what I'm saying is you start at serving time and you right. back plan everything based on what you know. And I think we do that same thing when we set up factories or we make products, right? We say a, a given piece of metal is going to take three hours to machine and I need to have it on the production floor a half an hour before, um, before it goes into the, the final assembly. I back plan that. And I make sure that at a minimum, my machine shop is tied in so that parts are coming off the machine and through inspection at the right time. You don't say on Monday, hey, I got to do a meal on Monday night at 7 o'clock and then realize, oh, my God, I have 48 hours worth of prep. And now I only have 12 hours left to do. So it's very much like everything you've ever done in a practice. It's funny you say that because I think of the comparison that when you talk about timing of everything in a, in a manufacturing facility, when you're trying to meet a deadline, well, somebody might say, well, just run that machining center faster, or why don't you turn up the speed on the press to 30 strokes per minute instead of 20? Well, the material will rip. You can't do that. You can't force it. To happen just like i can't turn the oven up to, to, to. exactly <laughs> if, if i want you know I, I mentioned roasting tomato i do that 250 degrees and it takes four hours to do if i gotta get it done in a half hour turning the oven up to 500 is going to turn them into into charcoal for cats, <laughs> not nicely roasted tomato so yeah, yeah you've got to be aware of your process i mean you know and, and these are things cooks learn and as engineers, we learn those things as well. We know what you what you can, what levers you can turn, and what levers you can't. Right, right. If talking about like as you were talking about the cooking and the process of timing of things, I I kind of think back to engineering and think back of things like lean and theory of constraints. Well, mm -hmm. you can only. There's only so many places in an oven you can place things. There's only so many burners on top of the stove. And you think about right. a Thanksgiving dinner. Well, I have to get in my mind what I can put in at certain temperatures, what things I can cheat a little bit on and, and do those things. But those are all based on the same philosophies of a theory of constraint. What are those? Uh -huh. And how do you go about that when you're planning something as large as a big dinner party uh, where you're very limited. It's different in a restaurant environment where you have a lot more uh, space to, to develop things, but. Actually, actually that's not always true. I've worked with some restaurants with one oven and it gets pretty <laughs> violent when people are looking to get to the oven. But um, it, it, it's um, one of the things I do when I'm doing like a big, a really big meal, a big fancy meal is uh, I will write out, the menu and I will write out uh, temperatures for things and, and what resources I'm going to use uh, next to them, just quick notes and that kind of thing. Uh, also, uh, I learned from a professional chef. I was taking a class from a guy named Michael Levitin, who has a who here in the Boston area is a big deal chef. And um, we got to eat, sit down and eat together after we, we took the class. We ate the food that was in the class and we were talking about 
uh, that exactly that kind of thing. And I said to him, I said, Oh, it must be nice to be, you know, I, I bet your house has a beautiful stove in it and all that. And he goes, no, I actually, in my house, I have a crappy electric stove. I'm like, oh, as a, as a professional chef, that must be really frustrating. He goes, no, I just learned how to use a stove differently. And I said, what do you mean? I said, I have an electric stove, too, and I hate my stove. He goes, I bet you try to regulate the electric stove like by like turning the temperature up and down. And I went, yeah, isn't that what the knobs are for? And he goes, no, you use an electric stove completely different. You, you, set, all your, you set your burners to different temperatures. And then you move your pan to the temperature you need because if you've ever cooked an electric stove, mm-hmm. you know that they don't respond like a gas stove. No. And, and I, I learned how to do that. So when I cook, for instance, I have a burner that's my full blast burner. Uh, you know, and I use that for boiling things and for doing a hard sear. But, you know, in a lot of recipes, you're doing things like when you make rice, for instance, you're, you're, you uh, bring the boil, reduce the simmer. And so I have my bring to boil burner and my reduced to simmer burner. And so when I look at my recipe, my menu planning, I figure out, okay, the rice is going to take 20 minutes. So I need to get that off of my bring to boil burner onto the simmer burner so that I can sear my scallops because I need the, the hot burner uh, only for three minutes. Mm-hmm. Right. So you, you, you learn to move stuff around that way. You also, project plan things like it's easier to bring a temperature up than it is to bring a temperature down in an oven. Mm -hmm. And so you start off with what's called a slow oven for things, and then you can bring them up. And you also learn that you can hold food by just turning your oven off after it's been at 450 degrees or something like that. And then shoving stuff in there. It's not putting any more food heat into the process, but it will keep your food food hole. You just learn tricks. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it's, it's like wearing, you know, I, I was talking to an old engineer friend of mine who was doing some, he has an old manual bridge port in his garage and he was like, yeah, I love actually calculating how to bring the backlash out of, out of my table. It, you know, we've lost the art of that because of all the CNC machines. I, I said, yeah, it's like cooking. It's like, I know exactly which pan is going to cook up that fast. And, you know, and so these are things you just develop over time, but they're science based, you know, and they're project. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. So be honest, if you have a, typical electric uh, cooktop, do you Uh store all your pans underneath or do you actually use that for a a heating uh, tray underneath? Oh, I actually actually use it uh, as a heating thing. But uh, when I redesigned my kitchen uh, a while back, I actually used a lot of the factory layout and the restaurant layout skills that I have. I I have a pull-out tour of the house, all my pans, layered up in a way that's easy to get to them. There's another drawer that I, my wife knows is the things that have holes in them, <laughs> right? All go in there. So it's, it's uh, my strainers, my uh, steamer baskets, my graters and all that kind of thing. So um, I, I, I actually do use a lot of factory layout skills. Uh, when I lay out kitchens, I've done some kitchens for some other people too. And um, y- you learn to uh, take those same skills. I know I sound like a broken record, but uh, cooking and working in a factory, your, your kitchen is a factory. You make stuff in there. Raw product comes in, finished product goes out. And if you think about it like that, if you think about that triangle that we hear about, if you think about the way you put stuff in drawers, if you think about the way you where you put your knives and where you put your pans, it becomes a much more enjoyable experience. You're not rattling around in a drawer looking for something. You're being present with the food. And the food knows if you're there or not. The food can feel if you're rattled. I'm convinced of that. Yeah. I, I, I've made things in a rush and tasted them afterwards. Or even Lynn will say to me, my wife, she'll say to me, oh, this really isn't working. And I'm like, yeah, my head wasn't in it. I was. I was in a, I was in a bad place. And so making your environment um, work well for you also can affect the taste of your food. So don't stir angry. 
Is that what you're saying? Don't stir angry. <laughs> unless, of course, it says, it, unless, of course, you have something in the recipe that says beef vinegar vigorously. <laughs> if you want to get good peaks on some egg whites, get pissed off at something. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that. When when you thought about launching this, what were some of the challenges that you had to kind of overcome when you were you were thinking about this that kind of said, boy, I'm glad I had my engineering skills for this? Well, it's definitely like engineering. It definitely requires a lot of project planning. And anybody, and you know this because you, you've done this sort of thing and we've talked about it. I like to use the parallel of I'm going to build a house. So one day I woke up and I said, I'm going to do this little stuff. It's like building a house. How difficult could that be? And then I found out there's a lot of things that need to happen before you even do your first blog post. For instance, I had to figure out what my name was going to be. And, um, you know, cause we're on social media, I actually crowdsourced it. And uh, sizzle and stem came from a lot of different ideas and my love of sizzle, the food, and stem. But I had to go out and I had to do copyright searches. I had to do some whole bunch of legal stuff. And then I had to decide what, who was going to host my site and what templates I was going to use and all of that. And all of that happened over the course of probably six weeks before I even got to start writing. And then I started to write. I started to post. And then I found out that um, my uh, according site is very uh, photographically intense. You have to put a lot of photos on. And I use very, uh, very high resolution pictures because I want the food to look pretty. Um, I found out that once you do that, you're going to have a problem and your site's going to run really slowly. So I spent another week learning about what the correct sizing was, how to, how to compress my pictures in a way that they look good, but they don't uh, take too long to load. I learned about the concept of lazy loading. I learned about things like uh, uh, alt tags, which is how the search engines see your pictures. People think that search engines like Google only see the text. They actually see your pictures, and that's how you get into your rankings. Um, I've learned to reach out to the community. There are uh, numerous uh, communities that you can join as a food, food blogger that will help you not make the same mistakes. You can make new ones all over again. Um, so my years and years of actually being a C-level uh, officer at my company where I had a whole staff of programmers and I would stand in the front of the room in front of a whiteboard and I would wave my arms and, 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 you know, do a concept and then I would look at them and go, okay, make that happen. Well, now that I'm a staff of one and I have to do all the programming myself, I learned to love my programmers. Mm -hmm. And, um, I've reached out to some of my, uh, some of my programming buddies for help. Uh, I've used all the project management, uh, tools, um, you know, I use tre a Trello board, for instance, mm -hmm. to make sure that I keep track of all my ideas. Uh, I have done uh, some some mind mapping for the uh, uh, how the site's going to be laid out because you find out pretty quickly that if anything is more than three clicks away from any place else, people get lost. So you actually have to do a whole topology of your site. So the engineering has been unbelievably helpful. Uh, and, and doing this. And um, if you're the type, engineers inherently like to learn, I believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that engineers are, are born and then we learn skills to make us into engineers. I know yeah. people who call themselves engineers who are not really engineers. They went to school for it, but they don't think like it. Um, being able to think like an engineer is invaluable in this process. And uh, I'm glad I did it. And there's the constant learning part, which you know, helps me get up in the morning, especially during these COVID days where you're locked down the house for hours. Yeah, you've done a great job and you should be very proud of uh, all your hard work. Uh, we're getting right at the end. Tell, tell us everybody where they can find your site. Sure. It is www.sizzleandstem.com. 
dot com. So that's S I Z Z L E A N D S T E M dot com. Um, I am also available on other social media, which I found out is an important thing to drive traffic. You have to be on Facebook and Instagram and, and Pinterest and all the other sites. So uh, go to those sites and search on Sizzle and Spam. You'll be able to find us there. Um, I would love it if you would follow us. Um, I would love it if you get interested in the site and you want to contribute. We're trying to build community. You'll see uh, things that are contributed by other people. So if you're like me and you're an engineer who loves to cook and you want to share some of your experiences, please do. Um, send me an email. Um, that's how you can find it. Great. Mark, I really appreciate your time. And I, I'd like to thank you again for being on the show. And I also like to thank our sponsors, the Precision Metal Forming Association and the PMA's Educational Foundation, as well as localenterprise.com. That's enterprise with a Z. And go out and make it a great day. Thank you, Dan.